So first of all, as might be obvious, ahem, uh, I'm clumsy. No, uh, on Saturday night, uh, after the game at which the Giants clinched the National League West division title, uh, I tripped and fell on the ramp. If you've ever been to Back Bell Stadium or AT&T, whatever it's called now, I tripped on the ramp coming out. I fell on my shoulder. I have a broken shoulder, although of a fairly mild type, and so it doesn't hurt at all when I'm wearing this sling. And eventually I do have to have surgery, but I don't know when. So stay tuned for bulletins. I figure if, it, if the surgery happens this week, I will miss Friday's class, and then we will have other Fridays to make up that lecture. But you should continue on. Study incredibly hard. In fact, you could say, if I could make it here to class on time with a broken shoulder, you can do your reading. Okay, so, there. all right, and today I'm going to do a little bit of catching up from the last lecture and use that as a launching pad for this lecture since I ran out at the end with, uh... okay, so today gender socialization, but so, as I said last time, there are really three major debates, and that is about whether socialization in general, social learning, is unitary versus modular, and again, I talked about that at length, pointing out that some of the research on the brain suggests that it's more modular than we imagine, because there are these very different systems that might pull the person or the motivation system in different directions. On the other hand, that prefrontal cortex that's so important to you is trying very hard to impose unity. I think that's basically how it works, that the brain is modular, but one of the systems, the sort of rational decision-making system, is trying very hard to create unity. Second, and this is gonna be very important today's lecture, the question of whether the important kind of socialization is deep versus superficial. And we tend to think of superficial, meaning on the surface, as by definition not very important, right? Whatever is just superficial, you can just toss off. But I think in Goffman, you saw very clearly how important surface aspects of the self are, right? So if you don't, if somebody shaves your head, takes away your name, takes away your individual clothing, depersonalizes you, it radically transforms something about who you are. So it's just sort of a warning not to assume that everything that matters has to be somehow deep inside. And then the third is what aspects of socialization are enduring versus malleable, meaning changeable, can be revised, transformed, updated, whatever. Okay, so this is the slide from last time. It has the graphics from last time. And uh, I'm just gonna rehearse the point that one of the new research frontiers is brain-environment interaction. And what that research shows is how malleable, how changeable, basic aspects of the brain are. So here's where those three debates I talked about, you really begin to see that, oh, what's biological, meaning the brain and the hormonal system and so forth, is not necessarily what is nature and therefore can't be changed. Actually, it's nature and it is highly transformable by experience. So the main thing they're learning about the brain is just how malleable it is. And then, this is the part I had to run out on, but I think it's very, very important. This new research on epigenetics and methylation. And again, this little drawing means absolutely nothing to me. Uh, that's all I can say is, I, I don't know what the heck they're talking about. I pulled it off. Um, Google Images, but one, if you look up methylation, there are hundreds of different images like this. But I do understand the basic logic here. 
which is DNA itself is malleable, is changed by experience. And one of the important ways it's changed, so everyone understands what DNA is, and that it, there's a quote unquote genetic code that is formed by the order of bases, so there are four basic molecules that make up DNA, and they come in pairs that create a double helix configuration, and that is like a coded message, right? So the exact ordering of those base pairs is the quote unquote genetic code, and it is transmitted from, you know, parents to children, and it's replicated by the cells in your body, but it turns out that there are really two issues. One is that that long, long strand, which you could imagine reading like a code, is actually in your body not a long strand. It's a tangled ball. And so only certain parts of that DNA strand are sticking out where another molecule could attach to it and read the code. So if something changes the 3D configuration of a strand of DNA, it can change your genetics, not because the code has changed, but because what can be read from the code has changed. So all the messages that were there are still there, but which ones can be read is different. And the same thing is true of this process called methylation. And methylation is when a, an organic molecule called a methyl group attaches itself to certain parts of the DNA. So that picture there is meant to show a DNA strand and the little green circles that mean almost nothing except maybe I know that RNA is ribonucleic acid um, are the places where the genetic code gets read. And this is showing you that you can have basically the same piece of DNA, but other molecules have attached themselves to the DNA, these methyl groups, and they prevent that segment of the genetic code from being read. Now, as I said very, at the whole beginning of this whole section on socialization, there is a tremendous amount being learned now about these processes and an amazing amount we don't understand. So we're at the very beginning, I think, of the understanding that will begin to link the social aspects of social learning to the biological aspects of these sorts of processes. But what they already suggest, and again, this has been studied pretty well in animal models, is that stress in utero and in early infancy actually changes the way the biological system processes stress and produces stress hormones. So the quote normal pattern of producing stress hormones, and here I talked about cortisol, which is the adrenaline system that gets you aroused when there's danger. And in quote, normal processes, you go along with a relatively low level of cortisol. Something frightening or upsetting happens and your adrenaline shoots up. I talked about you know turbulence on an airplane, but it could be needing to run from a robber on the street or uh, almost getting hit by a car, all those things produce this huge jolt of adrenaline which you will feel going through your body, changes your heart rate, changes your per perspiration, uh, gives you the, the energy people sometimes have to, you know, lift a car off someone's body, you know, with strength they didn't know they possessed. And then after the danger is over, your body calms down again and you go back to your kind of normal steady state level of arousal. When this methylation process has happened, it looks as though what happens is that that whole system gets thrown out of kilter, doesn't work right anymore, and either people's 
adrenaline levels, their cortisol stays very high all the time. So they are kind of agitated, on, uh, aroused, and at least in my imagination, those are the people who are ready at any second to lash out to get into a fight. They're just in a state of constant arousal, over overstimulated by adrenaline. Their adrenaline's pumping all the time. Or they are the kinds of people, and the other way it gets messed up is that basically they don't have a stress response. So the whole cortisol thing is suppressed. And then they stay cool no matter how frightening things are. They just don't get aroused. And both those can be the products of this methylation process. And again, here they know that some of those changes in the genes are themselves inherited. So when your cells form a uh, new, the, the kinds of cells that are, the germ cells that are going to produce the next generation of baby, right? Those methyl groups tend to drop off, right? So you don't, you don't inherit the methyl groups. You just inherit the genetic code, except some of the alterations caused by methylation apparently do survive into another generation. So we know very little about whatever changes that process. I'm not the authority on this. You have to take biology to understand it. But my point here is that the underlying biological systems on which social behavior depends are themselves altered by social experience. So biological does not mean unchanging. In fact, biological is perfectly compatible with extraordinarily powerful social influences on behavior. Okay, now back to this uh, lecture. Okay, so first I'm gonna talk very, very briefly about the development of gender uh, in children. And uh, this is another area where our whole, the way we understand gender and the way people experience themselves as gendered creatures, that is, as creatures with a masculine or feminine selfhood, is being transformed right before our eyes by very political social processes. So people are born with some kind of biological sex, and the vast majority of people are born with either male or female chromosomes, so females have XX and males have XY on whatever that, I think it's the 23rd chromosome, but whatever it is. And then there are some biological anomalies, so there are all these odd anomalies, pe people who have three Xs or XXY or this or that, that lead, actually they don't just lead to uh, gender anomalies, they lead to all sorts of other very serious, uh, what we call birth defects. And those chromosomal differences are linked to hormonal differences and some differences in brain development and so forth, but the big ones are the hormonal differences that really kick in at adolescence. So yes, there are two sexes biologically plus some anomalies. So there are hermaphrodites biologically who are born with anomalous sexual organs that are partly masculine, partly feminine. There are all, all sorts of other, possibly other states, but we tend to think of the world as basically boy bodies and girl bodies that have, and boy bodies have boy chromosomes, boy uh, hormones, and boy external sexual characteristics, and likewise, quote, normal females. Now again, 
there have always been, and we know this historically, uh, some intersexed or anomalous people. Again, the term is hermaphrodites. But biological sex is pretty well understood, I'd say. Gender identity, however, is a very different phenomenon. And I talked about this already when I talked about Kohlberg, that in a society in which there are only two categories, male and female, children learn very early on that which thing they are is a crucial, socially salient, essential aspect of their own identities, right? So you need to be either a boy or a girl if you live in a culture in which those are really the only two possibilities and everyone is one or the other. And if you think about things like the most basic aspect of our language in English, you cannot talk to or about someone if you don't know what gender that person is. So when you refer to someone, you have to say, and this happens all the time when you see someone with an adorable little baby. What's the first thing you do? You say, oh, how old is? Yeah, you have to, you cannot ask the question. You can't say, how old is it? <laughs> There's really no neuter for persons. No, we, we, I mean, you could have such a thing, but we don't have it. We only have he and she. There are many languages, Chichewa, which they speak in Malawi, does not distinguish he and she. So their word for person is just person. And there's no, you don't have to know whether it's a boy person or a girl person. And actually, Malawians who learn very, very good English will still write sentences like, um, he criticized her husband. No, that you can't even see. But, but anyway, they'll use the wrong what they mean is she criticized her husband for coming home late at night. But they'll write, or, or she, she loved his husband. They, they try to use the English, but it's very, very hard for them to remember to gender it correctly. So you, of course, they have other ways in which they signal that you have to be either male or female. And we know very, very well that when children anchor a very powerful sense of gender identity, it is almost impossible for them to change it. So now, but here's where I have to qualify what I'm saying, and this is a social transformation. It is not a biological transformation, it is a social transformation that increasingly in our society right now, there is growing assertion that there are other possibilities besides just being a boy or a girl. So there is increasing social legitimation of children who you could say refuse to or don't conform to or don't choose to be either boys or girls. So there are lots of, now lots probably means one in 10,000 families or something like that, but you can read, the, I think the New York Times Magazine about a month ago had a fascinating story about these families. And especially, I would say, with middle and upper middle class parents, they are increasingly organizing politically and socially to say, my child, Tommy, wants to wear dresses to school and be called Thomason, but he is not a girl. He knows he's a boy, and he's happy with himself the way he is. And the school and other children are just going to have to live with it, right? Now, that really truly did not exist in 
as a social possibility. It almost certainly existed as a psychological reality. But it did not exist as a social possibility even 30 years ago, right? So this is an emerging new gender category which is ambiguous. Now, I would say there is still enormous pressure on such families for their children eventually to, excuse me, are you taking notes? Good, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Okay, uh, for those families eventually to choose a gender for their children or for the children to choose. There are all sorts of biological interventions, so there are hormonal blockers people can use so that the time at which the child will externally develop the secondary sexual characteristics, breasts for girls, broad shoulders, and whatever for boys, uh, those won't kick in as early. So a 10-year-old, who is uncertain and whose family is willing to back her or him in that uncertainty can wait a few extra years before the external body will sort of irretrievably push her or him in one direction or another. But it's still true now, not 100%, but almost 100%, that the social destiny of such people is nonetheless eventually to externally be either male or female and to be unnervingly unreadable in the in-between state. Although you do occasionally see that in my social circle, I know one such person who is clearly born or whatever, a woman, so she has breasts, she looks like a woman, but she has, I believe, in the case I know, uh, taken some kind of male hormone, so she also has a beard and uh, some other male looking. So this is Berkeley, you didn't go to, you know, UCLA, you went here, and so that's why you can <laughs> appreciate such things in your environment. But uh, the point I wanna make is that Biological sex is there as an underlying reality. Gender is a socially ascribed category of the person that is incredibly important in people's core identity. And having a body out of whack with that core identity is basically intolerable. So there were studies over many years by a pair of researchers at Johns Hopkins, uh, John Money, and I think the first name of the woman was Anka Earhart, so they published a whole series of papers on this, of children who were wrongly sex typed at birth. And that's either because they had somewhat anomalous genitalia, that maybe a boy had undescended testicles and a very small penis, so the parents somehow thought this was a girl and so forth, or vice versa, they got, you know, thought somebody was a boy who really was a girl, maybe an enlarged clitoris or something like this, and raised the child in a gender that at puberty turned out to be the, quote, wrong gender. And these children do not suddenly say, you know, little Johnny does not, at age 13, start saying, oh, wow, I have breasts, I'm really a girl. Look at this, how great. Uh, I'll change my name to Jane. They react with horror. Horror. Fear anxiety, and so Money and Earhart actually pioneered the first sex change operations. They were actually done for children who suddenly at puberty started developing bodies that were completely out of sync 
with their deeply internalized gender identities. So the point here is that the gender identity is actually more powerful than the body. And we know that partly from the people who, whatever their biology, end up with a gender identity that is disconfirmed by their body. And then as adults, they need to go through sex change surgery or hormonal treatment or some amazing combination of stuff to get a body that fits who they feel they really are. Now, why some people, not because they had a biological anomaly in infancy, but just because of something about the way they grew up, decide that they really are in the wrong body, we don't know. That's a very, very complex thing. I, at least, I don't know. But for me, the message here is that both for all the, quote, normal people out there who are assigned the, quote, correct gender identity at birth, and as we discussed, become incredibly attached to it in early childhood, right? So that's when they're practicing the kind of gender policing that appalls their egalitarian, androgynous believing parents, and that's when the little boys can't get enough of trucks and the little girls can't get enough of princesses and bridesmaids or brides. And that gender identity seems to drive all sorts of other behavior. Okay, and then the last part of this picture is sex roles. And the way sociologists teach this, at least, is that Gender identity becomes very core to who people are. And sex roles is, are basically what society tells you at any given moment is appropriate to your gender, right? So gender is something like the socially learned category you belong to. And sex role, sex roles are the social meanings, behaviors attached to that gender. And those, you could see, could change very dramatically from one historical period to another. So in the 19th century, in the Victorian era, it was thought, for example, that higher education was impossible for women, and lots was written about this, because women had such delicate constitutions, they were so delicate psychologically and biologically, that learning all that difficult stuff would kill them. It devastated. They couldn't possibly do it. So the debates over women's education in the late 19th century, in the 1860s, 70s, and 80s, were about whether women were biologically and psychologically strong enough to be educated. So it's obvious that then the understanding of sex roles was that women were the domestic ones who stayed home and nurtured children, were incredibly delicate, and were so on and so forth. We still practice gender differentiation in a very powerful way, but being a good student has almost flipped sides. So we now, it is now true, literally true, that more women complete college proportionately than do men. So higher education has actually, well, education in general has become something that women are slightly better at than men are on average. And nobody thinks that you have destroyed your femininity by getting a college education. And there are similar changes in the way male sex roles are understood. So these vary enormously from one society to another. Within one society, the notion of what's normal or appropriate or admirable in women versus men may differ from one group to another. And they differ you know, hugely across um, historical time. And then I'm just putting in the last point, which goes all the way back to Durkheim. 
and his notion of organic solidarity, which is that rather than thinking, oh yes, we have an individual who has a certain biological sex, and then that individual learns from society a gender identity and attached to that gender identity is that individual's sex role, you can really think about the whole system of gender differences, not from the point of view of individuals, but from the point of view of society as a whole. And I would say the larger rule here is that in most societies in the world, what women actually do and what men actually do varies enormously from one society to another. In one society, for example, women do all the agricultural labor. This is true in many African societies where hoeing fields and planting crops and doing back-breaking manual labor 12 hours a day is considered women's work. That is what women do. In other societies, back-breaking physical labor would be considered utterly incompatible with being female. So in many of the North African and other uh, Islamic societies, uh, women are basically defined by the need to keep them largely out of public view. So they do a lot of work, but none of it is done out of the house. It's all done indoors. And so if you look across broad swaths of societies, in African societies, I, I don't know if this is still true, but in the 1980s, uh, female labor produced more than 80% of the total calories people in the society ate. So basically, procuring, producing food was largely women's work. In Muslim societies, women's labor produced 5% of the total calories people ate. So you can see that this is a feature of social life that differs hugely, as do many, many, many other tasks. What is more general, however, is the existence of a gender system that strongly differentiates what men do and what women do. So that in almost all societies, and ours is becoming a really, really interesting anomaly to this, a woman can't get along without a man because a man has to have someone to produce the basic grain on which he depends and to cook it, and only women do this. And a woman can't get along without a man because men are the ones who hunt, or in contemporary societies, they're the ones who go out and find paid employment and bring back whatever cash income the family has, which is crucial for paying for traditional healer, for health care, for taxes, for all sorts of other things. And so there's a system of gender differentiation in which women require men and men require women. And what men and women are like is very different, even though the actual thing that they do may be all male in one society and all female in another society. And uh, so you could look at it that the gender system creates gender differences, I would say in this weird way, in order to make women and men more dependent on each other. Okay, now, where are these gender differences located? And this is back to the same sets of oppositions I've been trying to work with all along. So one way of thinking about this again, tries to say that these gender differences are unitary, deep, and enduring. And it may locate the gender differences in deep early socialization that somehow is supposed to not be able to be changed, or in deep culture that somehow can't be changed, or in deep biology that somehow can't be changed, or in deep personality that somehow can't be changed. The other image is that, oh no, gender socialization is just modular, superficial, and malleable. So this is the other side of those three debates. So people pick up 
gender traits depending on where they are, what the opportunities are, and they can shed them just as easily if they're in a new situation. Now, what I want to do is again make this point that the idea that what is deep is also therefore what is lasting, is also unitary, that that easy, typical way of thinking about things is actually wrong. So I'm going to use the first example to point out, it's really a fascinating case basically of uh, not very, well, a very good research that turned out to be upended later. So a social psychologist named Matina Horner in the 1970s did an award-winning project, it was her dissertation, and it was called Fear of Success. And what she did was give a little fill-in-the-blank story to undergraduate students and have them complete the story. And the story went like this. It either said, uh, boys got a story that said, John just learned that he is number one in his medical school class. He, and then the students had to write the rest of the story. The female students got a story that said, Mary has just learned that she is number one in her medical school class, period. She, dot, dot, dot. Now, the men filled out the story. John married the girl of his dreams. His parents gave him a sports car to congratulate him for his success. He went on to develop, you know, an incredibly lucrative medical practice and lived happily ever after. That was basically the story the boys wrote. The girls wrote a story in which this poor Mary, who came out number one in her medical school class, faced disaster in one way or another. Some of these female students actually misread the story, and they said, and so she's happy to have a nursing degree, and uh, she's going to be just fine. Or they read the story correctly and said, but, and her boyfriend left her because she's so arrogant, and, um, or, or all the other kids in the class hated her, and so she could never get an internship or a residency, or she ended up lonely the rest of her life because no one would marry her, and uh, she was essentially hated and despised by everyone. So Matina Horner developed this very strong argument that women suffered from fear of success, that they did very well in school as in elementary school and even in high school and even in college, but when they got to the moment where they might actually triumph, they kind of undercut themselves, like, oh, I don't want to actually win. I want to be good, I want to be smart, I want to be liked by my teachers, I want to get A's, but really being successful is just too scary, I can't handle it. And so that became a huge thing, fear of success there were, and the idea was that women had deeply internalized a kind of fear of success that allowed them to get close to grabbing the brass ring, but at the last moment not to be able to actually assert themselves, reach out, and seize success. And women worried about this and so on and so forth. Now, how good is your sense of experimental design? So, this is an experiment in which, what's the independent variable? Gender, okay, great. So the independent variable is gender, and how did they manipulate, what did, what did they actually vary? <coughs> what did they vary? Here, somebody's gotta speak up loudly enough I can hear. Put up, somebody put up a hand so I can call on you. I'm not going to make a fool of you, I'm going to, yes, Emily, yeah. Girls read a story about girls and guys read a story about Aha. So they didn't just vary one thing, they varied two things, right? The gender of the person who got the story and the gender of the person the story was about. 
So how do you do that? And again, it's not that Mateen Horner was stupid. This was very innovative research, but that's the sense in which social science research actually progresses. So what would you do to improve that piece of research? Yes. Yeah. Oh. Do you see how each person will change genders? Exactly. See how each person, so what happens if you give the story about, and this again is in the 1970s, what if you give the story about John to both men and women, and give the story about Mary to both men and women? Lo and behold, it turns out that both men and women saw John is triumphing and being happy ever after. And both men and women saw Mary as facing great difficulties because she was too successful. So what researchers had interpreted as a deeply internalized part of the female psyche that basically couldn't be eradicated even by having positive experiences of success in school turned out to be both men and women reading the social world the same way and saying a, a man who's very successful is going to be given a lot of rewards and seen as great, and a woman who's very successful is going to be seen as, in some ways, problematic. And then, lo and behold, two more things. First of all, when they did this same exact research with African-American women, they never got the effect. So African-American women were perfectly good with Mary being successful. They did not have the apprehension that the social world was going to punish the woman for her success. And secondly, the effect has dropped away over time in contemporary women. So as the social world has changed, and there are more avenues of success for women, and there's no longer the expectation that the woman will be less educated than her husband, and that the doctor will marry his nurse, or his receptionist, or his secretary. And again, I mean, my mother was my father's secretary, just so you know that I don't uh, have any contempt for such a situation. But it's now we know, actually, from a lot of data that it's much more common for the male doctor to marry a female doctor, for the woman lawyer to marry a male lawyer, for the, uh, assuming everyone's heterosexual, which they're not, but for people to partner up with people of equal rather than very unequal uh, social status. And again, not universal, but it's increasingly common. Neither men nor women any longer expect a woman who's number one in her medical school class to face a life of difficulty. So here's the case where, again, what was interpreted, what was seen as a product of deeply internalized psychological preferences that were hard to change turned out to be a product of so social realities that both genders were reading in many ways correctly. Uh, okay, and then the second is a study of just the opposite type. It's a great book by Rosabeth Moss Cantor called Men and Women of the Corporation, done around the same time. And this was one that said gender difference really isn't internal at all. It's all due to different structures of opportunity. And what she looked at were differences between women employees in the corporation and male employees in the corporation. And she, at that time, there were very, very few women, and the women who were there were there as tokens, right? So there was a little, this was in the early 1970s, some pressure to hire women. So you would have this situation where the vast majority of managers in the firm were men, one or two women, the women didn't have role models, they didn't have mentors, they were left out of the conversations that occurred on the golf course or 
uh, in the men's room. They were sort of isolated. And so women had different styles than different personalities than men did. And she looked both at women executives and at secretaries. And she argued that the secretaries had what she called blocked mobility, which is you couldn't move up from being secretary to assistant manager to manager to executive to executive vice president to whatnot, whatnot. There was a secretarial track all right, and it depended 100% on your boss being successful. So if you were the secretary to a mid-level manager and he was successful, you would move up as he moved up. Now, this, do any of you watch Mad Men? Ah, well, this is the world of Mad Men. And of course, the anomaly is the wonderful what's her name, who, don't tell me anything about what happens to her. I'm only in the middle of season, season two. You cannot F in the course guaranteed if you ruin Mad Men for me. <laughs> so I know you won't. But uh, the one who starts out as the secretary and becomes essentially one of the creatives in the agency is a total anomaly. And you see the world of the secretaries, and this is really what Cantor talked about. You really can't achieve something great that's going to advance you. All you can do is make a mistake that gets you into trouble, right? So the psyche of people with blocked mobility is that somewhat rigid, uptight, blame someone else, I didn't do it. Again, somewhat rigid mentality. And she argued that that mentality had nothing to do with being a woman. It had to do with being in this structural situation where there was nowhere you could move. And again, where the only difference you made in your job was if you happened to make an appointment for your boss or to use the Mad Men example, failed to cover for your boss when he was out of the office, uh, you could suddenly be in terrible trouble. But you couldn't get any points by saying, oh, let's not worry about that rule, let's get the job done. Whereas people who had power, who could actually do something, balance the need to follow organizational rules with the need to get the job done. So they're the ones who take the risks, who do creative things, who uh, lead people ahead. And these block mobility secretaries are, again, uptight, rigid, defensive, unwilling to adapt. Uh, you come and say, oh my God, we don't have time to go through these six forms. We're gonna lose a $6 million sale if we don't move on this today. And she says, I'm sorry, that's not my responsibility. You'll have to try, you know, that was the standard mode. And then these executives who were in the token role, she argued, had the worst of all possible worlds because they had responsibility, but they actually had no power. And that was because in the informal structure, they couldn't get information, they couldn't get cooperation, they couldn't get support for the things they needed to do. And that led them to a very unpleasant uh, attempt to shift responsibility onto other people for their own inevitable failures. So it turned out, and there's still some data like this, even in the present, that both men and women prefer male bosses. Why? Not, Cantor argued, because male bosses are nicer but because the main thing you really need in a boss is someone who has enough power to protect you, enough power to advance your career, and enough power to make sure that your group is actually successful. So she argued that there's really no difference between men and women inherently, that all the differences they observed really had to do with organizational structure. Now, uh, I'm going to show you, maybe not until the le next uh, lecture, that that view is not quite right either.
there are fairly persistent differences between women and men that appear even in the kinds of organizations that really do offer equal opportunity, but I'm gonna argue that those differences are not deeply internalized permanent psychological qualities. They are much more a matter of styles, skills, habits, and external expectations. Okay, I will email you if I'm not seeing you on Friday. Otherwise, uh, expect a lecture on Friday. All right, see you then. <laughs>